the 10th Sunday after Collect, the 10th Sunday after Trinity, the Collect. Lord, let your ears be open to your people's prayers around the globe today. Cause them to ask, seek you, and to think good things, and to ask good things of you. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, verse 2 of hymn 678, we'll have about another 20, 25 hymns left before we end the Episcopal hymn book. A 20th century hymn, 678. Make his deeds known, known to the peoples. Tell out his exalted name. Praise the Lord who has done great things. All his works, his might proclaim. Zion, lift your voice in singing, for with you has come to dwell in your very midst, the great and holy one of Israel. Very nice. Well, we are with uh, Professor William G.T. Shedd, famous Presbyterian historian. I believe he taught at Union. It's uh, his dogmatic theology, and uh, but one has to notice very early on here the word dogmatic does not mean, in the modern sense, pontifical, and, um, opinionated, being dogmatic has a pejorative, a negative sense to the word. He's being dogmatic. He's issuing obit or dictas, you know, like the infallible magisterium in Rome, so to speak. But really, the word dogma, uh, in the sense he's using it here, is uncolored by those associations in a certain way. It means teaching from the Greek word dogma. Or doctrine. This might have been called teaching theology, or doctrinal theology, or systematic theology. It would um, or even confessional theology. The idea of dogma, church confessions, which are church teachings. So we uh, don't say this to um, shield our professor. Uh, or we do say to shield him, I should say, because he's not, he's meaning in the sense of teaching, uh, not in that pejorative 21st century. Um, he was the Roosevelt Professor of Systematic Theology in Union Theological Seminary of New York. I mean, I wonder who, they probably hold his papers, maybe. Um, That would be an interesting, uh, uh, some friends in New York City may be, may be of interest there to check the archives out. I, I can't bring myself to go to New York City again. I just can't. Uh, when I go to New York City, I have one objective, drive from, <laughs> enter it and get out as quickly as I can on the other side. I just can't do it. Um, I couldn't live there either, I don't think. No offense to New Yorkers, but it's just not for yours, truly. We're living a quiet, peaceful life here. We're in Volume 1, the second edition, published by Scribner's Sons in 1889. He only lived, was it 72 years, I think? Or 70 years? Uh, let me check here. Give me a second here. Maybe it might be good to just kind of go over his life before we get started. Um, he was, yeah, he lived 74 years. He was born 1820, died in 1894. So the volume we're talking about was published five years before his death. He was the child of a Presbyterian family. Um, and he was an American Presbyterian, born in Massachusetts, Acton. He enrolled at the University of Vermont, became a protege of the UVM president, James Marsh. He was affected by Samuel 
Taylor Coleridge and transcendentalism. He graduated from UVM in 1839 and taught school for a year, and he, at which time he began attending a Presbyterian church. He then felt called to the ministry and entered Andover, Newton in 1840. Now, the American country is only, in terms of constitution, is only 51 years old. He studied under Leonard Woods. He graduated in 1843. Uh, he served as a professor of English literature at the University of Vermont, professor of sacred rhetoric in Auburn Theological Seminary, 1852 to 1854, and professor of church history at Andover, 1854 to 1862. That should be helpful to him. We'll be looking in, as we work in his dogmatics to see his work in church history. And then after a year, associate pastor of Brick Presbyterian Church in New York City um, that has had historically good reputation in sacred literature, 1863 in systematic theology at Union until 1890. He died in New York City on September, November 19th, 1894. This article says he was a high Calvinist and was one of the most notable systematic theologians of the American Presbyterian Church. What is a high Calvinist? Isn't that just kind of a form of stuttering? What else would you expect a confessional Presbyterian to be? Um, he served as an editor, or he did the three volume dog, dogmatic theology. Uh, published 1888-1894. He served as the editor of Coleridge's complete seven volumes. He wrote lectures on the philosophy of history, in which he applied to, to history the doctrine of organic revol evolution. I wonder what his views of evolution were. Manual of Church History, two volumes. History of Christian Doctrine, two volumes, Homiletics, Pastoral Theology, Sermons to the Natural Man, Theological Essays, Literary Essays, Commentary to the Epistle of Romans, I didn't know that, Sermons to the Spiritual Man and the Doctrine of Endless Punishment, 1885. He would have been a contemporary of Charles Hodge, Princeton, not too far south. I'd like to check the mileage, 40 miles, 50 miles south, maybe, of New York City. wonder if the two ever met each other or talked or met at general conventions. Probably some backstories there, probably some letters and correspondence that could be dug out. Well, that's... W H W G T shed. Well, let's see if we can get a, get a start here. Published by Charles Scribner's in New York City. And he writes a foreword here to the classes for whom this theological system was prepared and whose faithful attention to its delivery was a constant encouragement. It is respectfully and affectionately ascribed by the author. He, did, he was mentioned at uh, Westminster Seminary, but we didn't read anything, and we didn't have electronic stuff to pull it up. And it was only in the library. We all had limited budgets, and I don't think it was widely published or available on the broader market. It was published and then stuck on library shelves. I remember a Reformed Episcopal Seminary uh, finding him and reading him years ago. Preface, the immediate preparation of this treatise began in 1870. 
50 years old, was he? Yeah, 50 years old. When the author was called to give instruction for a year in the Department of Systematic Theology at Union Seminary. The work was resumed in 1874 when he was elected to this professorship and was prosecuted down till 1888 by some general prep but some general preparation had been made for it by previous studies and publications. The writer had composed a history of Christian doctrine in the years 1854 to 1862, that'd be my worth tracking down, which was published in 1863, a volume of theological essays containing discussions on original sin and vicarious atonement, something you'll never hear much about in any Presbyterian pulpits today, I don't think and a volume of sermons to the natural man, predominantly theological in their contents. That'd be interesting, too. The doctrinal system here presented will be found closely connected with these preceding investigations, and this will explain the somewhat frequent references to them as parts of one whole. The dogmatic system is the natural introduction to the dogmatic theology. A general type of doctrine is Augustino-Calvinistic. Upon a few points, the elder Calvinism has been followed in preference to the latter. This probably is the principal difference between this treatise and contemporary ones of the Calvinistic class. Upon the subject of Adam's sin and its imputation, the author has been constrained to differ from some theologians for whom he has the highest respect with whom he has, in general, a hearty agreement. In adopting the tradition theory of the original origin of sin in the interest of the immediate imputation of the first sin, he believes that he has the support of some of the most careful students of Scripture and deepest thinkers in the history of the Church. That we go there, too. We're traditions here. I am. I mean, it will re revisit that. Does not deny federal imputation. Embraces both. Some further development of it has been attempted with what success the reader must judge. The doctrine of the Trinity has been constructed upon the Nicene basis but with more reference to the necessary conditions of personality and self-consciousness and the objections to the personality of the introduced, infinite introduced by modern pantheism. That may explain to some of Prof. W.H. G. Griffith Thomas's concerns to amplify on the personality of the three persons in the Trinity. He seems to have that floating in the background of his head. And he makes some statements to that effect that seem, just seem peculiar when we're reading it. But that's at the University of Wycliffe, University of Toronto Wycliffe College. It's really fascinating. I'm really interested in this connection between the Hodge family. Warfield and this the statement of the doctrine of decrees <coughs> oh I'm sorry in retrospect to the ontological argument for the divine existence the author is in sympathy with the a priori spirit of the old theology is he drawing a contrast between him and Princeton the statement of the doctrine of decrees and of regeneration is founded upon the postulate that all holiness has its source in the infinite will and all sin in the self-determination of the finite. It will be objected by some to this dogmatic system that it has been too much influenced by the patristic medieval and reformation periods. Too I've seen this quote before too little by the so-called progress of modern theology. 
the charge of scholasticism and perhaps speculativeness will, will be made. The author has no disposition to repel the charge. Uh, speak on, brothers and sisters. Here's where I'm at. I calmly offer my assertions. That's kind of what he's saying. It's kind of a nice spirit, a spirit of meekness, gentleness. And I think we'll see firmness, kindness. Um, and I'm in the Anglican tradition. And there's always quibbling around investments, colors, frontals, all that stuff. The externalities. I'm kind of more on the simple side. But more important than the vestments are the inner vestments of meekness, gentleness, thoughtfulness, scholarship, firmness of conviction, yet tempered by kindness and love. While acknowledging the excellencies of the present period in respect to the practical application and spread of religion, he cannot regard it as preeminent above all others in scientific theology. It is his conviction that there were some minds in the former ages of Christianity who were called by providence to do a work that will never be outgrown and left behind by the Christian church. Thank you. So, some men thought more deeply and came nearer to the center of truth upon some subjects than any modern minds. Bada boom. There's the price of the book moment right there. That's my, uh, for those of you who know me, I call it the P-O-B-M moment. Price of the book moment. Uh, that is where a paragraph or a page just glistens and shines out like the sun and makes the price of the book worth buying. Now, I'm working here with the internet internet.org which you don't have to buy it anymore you can read it online non omnia possums omnia omnis no one age or church in advance of other ages or churches at all things it would be difficult to mention that intellect in the 18th 19th century whose reflection upon the metaphysical and nature of metaphysical being and nature of God has been more profound than that of Ansel. <laughs> For those of you unacquainted with academies, that's a slam dunk, put politely and kindly. And Ansel, those 11th century towers, the way he has way of saying it, over 18th and 19th century metaphysics and really corrects <laughs> the thinking of some of the enlightened thinkers. I think that's where that can go. Whose thinking on the Trinity has been more subtle and discriminating than Athanasius of the 4th century. Towers over the 19th, 20th, 21st century. That's where that goes. Although there's a volume up here, there's Dr. Robert Ray Raymond, a systematic theologian, formerly of Covenant Theological Seminary, who did ex exquisite work on Chalcedonian Christology. Towers over many books. It's in a top tier category. I haven't assessed. It's in the top tier for me, top in the top one, two, three percent, which I don't hand out like candies to children, as it were. But I, I like what the, he's saying here. It's showing the influence of church history. We do Old Testament, New Testament, systematic theology, number three, church history, practical theology, contemporary theology. Now the contemporary guys, well, what's all that got to do with today? You know, I'm, I'm right here living in the immediate. There are no absolutes. You know, how do we know? 
I don't understand your whole question. But I can see already on page 19, he's already showing the influence of church history on the systematics. This is a systematic theology called dogmatic theology. And we talked about it at the beginning. More comprehension and searching than that of Augustine. He's putting Athanasius over Augustine on the Trinity issue, whose apprehension of the doctrine of the atonement has been more accurate than that formulated in the creeds of the Reformation. Yeah. It's over anything in the 20th century. What compares to the Westminster Confession of Faith? What? Show me anything in the Episcopal Church that's on that level. But they, they've thrown that stuff out in the hubris. And that becomes out here in practical theology. What do we say as churchmen, churchwomen, to bishops and arrogance? Oh, boy. You say that and you're in trouble. But I think it has to be said exactly what he's saying. Anybody in the Episcopal Church 20th century like Athanasius or Anselm and his metaphysical thinking or Augustine on grace, sin, or the atonement? Is it the Reformation period? I think not. I talked to my own bishop, won't mention his name, last year. He doesn't know me. I mean, he comes two, three times a year. You know, we give coffee at, after the church service and he's gone. You don't see him again. So he, he would know my face, doesn't know my name, doesn't know anything about my background because I don't talk about it. And I, I said to him after the church service, sir, could I come out? I was very polite. Could I come out and sit down with you and have 20, 30 minutes of your time to talk? And he goes, well, what do you want to talk about? I said, well, I'd like to talk about theology. He looked at me immediately and said, I don't talk theology. I don't think I laughed. I hope I didn't. I was polite enough not to. I know I was shocked. I'm hoping that it was just the look of shock and not laughter, which would have implied disrespect. On the other hand, on the other hand, what would it be disrespectful to laugh at him? I don't think so. Elemental mockery, well, we'll try to restrain that. But it was pretty funny. To, it's the oddest thing I've heard in 20 years out of a churchman. I don't talk theology from the bishop. It's like going to the doctor and you know, with a medical problem, he says, oh, I don't talk medicine. You go to your lawyer and write your will, living trust. Oh, I don't talk about the law. You get my point. Or the auto mechanic who's, you know, working on your car. Oh, I don't talk about mechanics, sorry. In drawing from these earlier sources, the writer believes that systematic theology will be made both more truthful and more vital. Yes. Confinement to modern opinions tends to thinness and weakness. Oh, my goodness. Uh, this is 1889. The latest intelligence is of more value in a newspaper than in a scientific treatise. If an author in any department gets into the eddies of his age, you know, the swirling in a, in a creek, and whirls round and round in them. He knows little of the vast sweep of the stream of the ages, which holds on its way forever more and forever. This may be better than Charles Hodge. This is gold. If this treatise has any merits, they are due very much to daily and nightly communion with that noble army of theologians, which is composed of the elite, of the fathers, of the schoolmen, of the reformers, 
and of the 17th century divines of England and the continent. And let it not be supposed that this influence of the theologians is at the expense of that of the scriptures. This is one of the vulgar errors. Scientific and contemplative theology is the child of revelation. It is the very word of God itself, as this has been studied, collated, combined, systematized by powerful, devout, and prayerful intellects. Wow. I'm thinking this is above Charles Hodge's systematic theology. And maybe coming up near Dr. Robert Raymond's, but the jury's out. The jury is not the jury's hearing the evidence. And I'm in the jury. I'm a common man. We use the common man standard. What does a reasonable man, a reasonable woman, a reasonable person think as they hear the evidence? Well, I think we probably should come to a close here. This is the price of the book, Mama P.O.B.M. for those who listen, but you don't have to buy it. It's it's on archive.org. We have here another uh, it's just the same one as the last one, all a different tune. <clears throat> oh, yes. This, this requires a highlighter in 680 in the Episcopal Hymn Book. Oh God, our help in ages past, our hope for years to come our shelter from the stormy blast and our eternal home. That one will, that one will play and sing all day long. Hallelujah for that Watts hymn. I may consider that for my funeral. I don't want to see. Let us pray. God Almighty, we thank you for the giants of the age, ages and this professor's postulation of that point men you've lifted up in providence to be of special help to the church through the centuries. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen.